Hey there folks, welcome to the edition of Stranger in a Southern Land. I, of course, am your host, Jake Manning. Today on the program, I speak with fighter, comedian, promoter, and author, Christopher Corrado. You know, me and Christopher, we've seen each other open mics. We've talked a little bit and stuff like that. We're a little bit different than some of the other comedians. We're probably the ones drinking water and eating almonds at open mics. But, uh... I was just very fortunate to sit down and talk with Chris because, you know, Chris has booked me on a lot of his shows in Rock Hill, South Carolina, and some very interesting ones in Catawba, South Carolina. You know, Chris is a very direct, straightforward person, and I think you're going to get that with this interview, but I think I pulled a little bit out of him. He's a little reserved, but I think I got a little bit out of him, especially when we got to the part of his life that I didn't even know about. Apparently, he's written two books. And I was very surprised by that, and I had a ton of, ton of questions about that. And I think that's when Christopher kind of opened up a little bit, you know, because you know, we could talk about comedy, we could talk about this, we could talk about dieting, and it's very mundane to us. But, like, just opening up about him writing two books, I mean, and he's, I think he's younger than, no, he's, we're roughly about the same age. I, I, I don't want to date myself. I might be older than him. I definitely look older than him, that's for sure. But just a fantastic guy to talk to, and I just really wanted to shine a light on what Chris does. He does a fantastic thing by promoting a lot of shows in South Carolina, runs a lot of rooms down there, and just chasing his dream and a lot, not and letting anything hold him back. Very straightforward person, so it gets kind of interesting a couple of times in the interview. I go into these long questions, and I get very short, direct answers forget how direct he is about with everything but he's not wasting any time folks that's for sure he's a very busy man especially when it comes to him being a fighter amateur boxer boxer that is he's done a couple of fights and he's also like doing like muay thai and he's also as a trainer at a gym he's dieting hard he's doing comedy he's doing open mics he's promoting shows writing books apparently that i didn't even know about so interesting guy very glad to be talking to him today that as always, I'm very glad to be talking on the Shining Wizards Podcast Network. I can't thank them enough for all of the hard work they do for me. So make sure you follow them on ShiningWizardsNetwork.com. But also, I really can't thank my producer, Don, enough for everything he does for me. He's a fantastic guy. He's been there for me since day one. He's been a fantastic producer. I can't think of any other way that he could be a better producer. And guess what? Those services that he provides for me, he could provide for you. So if you want to start a podcast, if you're like, hey, if this idiot Jake Manning can have a podcast, I can do one, but I really don't know how. I think I need a producer. Well, guess what? I have one for you. You can have my producer and do a better job than me. Okay, good on you if you can. And know how you can do, follow that dream and to prove me wrong and prove to me that I'm an idiot, get done. One of the best producers when it comes to podcasting. He's been always available for me 24-7, although he may hate that I said that, but he's always available for an email, for a phone call, or whatever. He's always never missed a deadline whatsoever, always got things done on time. He runs a very tight ship. And he is just a fantastic guy to be working with on my projects and all my other podcasts. So he could work for you like he works for me. But all you have to do is just log on to dsct.tv for more information. Also, too, he's got a bunch of good podcasts on, the, on that website. So make sure you check those out as well. Also, too, guys, make sure you check out a couple of my comedy dates coming up. I'm also promoting a show, and I've always and I have been promoting a show for quite some time at the Evening Muse, and it's the all organic open mic. And we return to the Evening Muse on Tuesday, December the sixth, with feature performer Todd Riley. Make sure you show up for that. I'm very excited about that show. I'm very excited to have Todd. Todd's been kind of zigzagging the country with me. I, you know, I was in Iowa not too long ago. He was in Iowa not too long ago. He was in Ohio. I was in Ohio not too long ago. He's been all over the place. So I'm very thankful that he's going to be in town in Charlotte, North Carolina, Tuesday, December the 6th at the Evening Muse. Like I said, for more information about that show, make sure you log on to eveningmuse.com. Also, too, guys, I will be emceeing at the Comedy Zone from December the 13th through the 17th. Yes, I will be emceeing like five shows. Well, five plus shows, but five days, five nights. I will be there. So if you've always wanted to see me in like an A-list club, I highly recommend that you show up to the Comedy Zone in Charlotte, North Carolina. For more information about those shows, make sure you log on to cltcomedyzone.com. And then Sunday, December the 18th, PWX will be returning I believe in Concord, North Carolina. I forget exactly the exact town, but all you got to do is just log on to pwxpro.com for more information about that show. I do know we're running that Sunday, 
December the 18th. As always, I'm sure things pop up last minute, last second stuff comes up. I think there's a couple other shows I'm emceeing. I know there's a lot of MC dates coming up in December, so I want to make sure to let you know that I'm available for all those and give you opportunities to come see those shows. And all you got to do is just follow me on social media. And that's very easy to do because I'm very active on Twitter at Man Scott Manning or on Instagram at Man Scott Manning. If you have a question about the podcast or if you're going to become a sponsor of this podcast, all you have to do is just email me at jake at sslshow.com or if you're to book me for an upcoming wrestling event make sure you email me at manscoutmanning at yahoo.com now without further ado let's talk with fighter comedian promoter and author christopher corrado here on stranger in a southern land I appreciate you sitting down and talking with me on my podcast and stuff like that. No problem. You know, but uh, you and I are are men cut from similar cloth, (laughs) I would say. You know, we're, you know, we're both obviously politically minded, but also too, we're comedians and we also do a very physical activity on the outside. Of course, pro wrestling is mine. Uh, Boxing is yours and and fighting also too, or or have you dabbled in like- That's some amateur fighting. That's an amateur, amateur fighting stuff like that, but also like I've seen you like in a gi and stuff like that, or am I making that up? No, no, no. I do judo too. Just okay. haven't competed. Okay, I was making sure. <laughs> I dropped him ahead a lot. I take a lot of head blows. I don't know if that that's the case or something like that. But uh, but no, like uh, we we had a really nice conversation at one of your shows recently because you, you run a lot of shows here in the local Rock Hill, South Carolina area and stuff like that. And we were just talking about how. Like as a comedian and stuff like that, like a lot of the comedians that we see at these open mics are like, we'll have six beers, <laughs> you know, they'll order a slice of pizza, they'll mow down on a hamburger where you and I are eating like almonds yeah. with protein shakes and just, you know, all kinds of stuff. So it's about health and fitness and stuff like that. So like, but you weren't always so health conscious and stuff like that. No. Like, and, and I think that's an interesting story. Maybe that's a jumping off point for us is like, you know, how big were you at one point in time? Probably about 40 pounds heavy or so. Like, like, like well, wait, like what are we talking here? Close to 190. 190. Okay. So, but your frame, like, you know, I, I, the pictures that I saw, you didn't wear it very well at 190. <laughs> no. <laughs> and what do you, do? And, and you're obviously 190, but I'll do 150. Yeah, one mid one fifties. Yeah, little mid one fifties. So, like, what was the change? What what you what made you decide I need to live a, a healthier lifestyle? Well, I've always been big into working out, but what a lot of people don't think about is that you could work out two three hours, but it's really your meal plan, what you're eating, that makes the difference. Mm-hmm. Because I can work out for three hours, but a combo meal at Burger King five minutes later, it's over. Mm-hmm. And then you just not only did you destroy the workout, you actually put yourself backwards. Mm-hmm. So. <clears throat> I worked for Pizza Hut for about 14 years. and That'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> My girlfriend works for Mellow Mushroom, and it's not doing me any favors. No, like no. she, Especially when like she comes home, she's like, hey, they screwed up this order. And I go, what was the order? Oh, it was a large pe- pizza. It was buffalo chicken. And I go, what was wrong with it? Oh, they put like double extra bacon on it. And I'm like, oh, uh, I didn't realize that was a mistake. <laughs> 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 you know, it was the mistake is putting more bacon on it, but now it resides in my fridge and I will probably eat some of it tomorrow. Which then will be a mistake. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so th- then that's where the mistake comes back in. <laughs> but yeah, working at Pizza Hut. Tell me. Well, I did that, you know, just when I first moved down here from New York, you know, it was just a job to do while I was in school. And um, I went to school, I got a degree in journalism. Oh, okay. And that's a tough field to get into. Here at Winthorpe? Winthrop, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was mass communication, concentration, and journalism. And then you might have taken a class from my boss's wife. I think she works. She definitely is a professor at Winthrop, and I think she does some mass media studies or something like that. What's and her name? Christy. Uh, I mean, Bikikio was. This is almost ten years ago, though. Okay, well, you she's been teaching her that long, I think. Okay. Also, New York transplant as well. Okay. So, I don't know. I don't think I had her, but yeah. Okay, maybe. Maybe just missed her or something like that, but it's just funny, the connection. But anyways, you move down here, you get your journalism degree, you work in a pizza hut, uh, you feel feel doughy just like the dough that you're serving to people. <laughs> <laughs> Back yeah. into it. <laughs> yeah, I did that for, like I said, about a total of 14 years, um, and I was seeing somebody, you know, at the time, and I realized I wanted to have a future, 
and I didn't really see as much of a future with the writing, so I moved up and you know became an assistant and a general manager. But before I became the general manager, our relationship you know ended. But that's and uh, when I started to do comedy, and then I started doing comedy, and then still doing Pizza Hut. And then I finally said, you know what? I just really want to get into the gym business because I love working out so much. Mm-hmm. But it was just the diet was always the thing. Yes. See, that was that was the thing with me because I I would say my workout. I revamped it maybe about three or four years ago, but pretty much it had been the same for 10 years, which is not good. But like during the, that, well, maybe not 10 years, but like probably I think from 2011, yeah, 2011 to 2005, 2006, it had been about the same. And during that time I had seen fluctuations Ranging from, you know, being at about 220 to getting all the way up to 260, 270, mm. and then all the way down to 183, then back to 240, and then back to about two, 220. Wow. And it, with the same exact weight workout, same exact every day, you know, you know certain body parts, same things, it, you know, exact same for how for that entire time. But seeing fluctuations in my weight, like that range right there. Without you know changing my diet, of course, was the diet was the, like the big key to all of that. So, yes, and uh, that's extremely important. But uh, you say you're transplanted from New York. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, obviously, as people could tell from your your uh, my accent. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so it's not like you you were born here and all of a sudden you're the the one unicorn that has this thick New York accent in, in Rock Hill, South Carolina. But uh, you know, whereabouts in New York? Um, the borough was Queens. Okay. And the section was Flushing. Okay. Yeah, I've been to Flushing multiple times. Okay. I've uh, I've been at wrestling conventions. I think I've even wrestled there. I'm not for sure, but I've I've been in that that area multiple times and stuff like that. But but you came he- directly here f- just for journalism school? No, I came here right after high school. My mother wanted to get out of New York, and I said, you know, I might as well just go there and try it. Mm-hmm. And I just never left Rock Hill. Yeah. So, but, but journalism like piqued your interest, and that was what you were interested in going to school for. What what was it about that that you were interested in? I like to write, and I like to you know conversate with people. So I thought, why not do something where I feel like that would work, where I could write stories. Mm-hmm. What, what you know what, what what makes you wanted to be in the factual side of writing as opposed to you know I, I'm a writer and I want to write a story about this kid named Harry and he might be a wizard like what 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 lends you towards journalism well I like I like the pro you know like doing like feature stories and profile stories so I've always been one to like to just sit down with somebody kind of like we're doing right now but instead of like being on camera or a podcast you know just just write it out and then people read it and they could you know get use their imagination a little bit and just zone out into it and get a good read mm-hmm. what was your most like I'm sure you did projects and profile pieces on people. What's you know what was one like profile piece that you really enjoyed or one that you've read that you're like oh this is I got an insight into a person. Oh, I was like I liked writing about the elections. Uh, one time I had to write a story. I had to go to a, like I think three different uh, voting spots, you know, and just talk to people when they came out. And I thought that was pretty cool. You know, you really didn't go into like you know who they voted for, but it was more or less like why is it important to vote and stuff like that and mm-hmm. whatnot. Yeah, and that's that's the thing that I, I ran into today. I was telling you before we started recording is that I had a three and a half hour conversation with my my lawn care guy <laughs> about the election. Uh, he obviously thought I was extremely happy about what happened. Uh, I necessarily I didn't feel that way. <laughs> I know I look like a person that would be ecstatic. <laughs> that's part of the problem, and usually, and that's, he's not the first person to assume that, and then get hits with uh, a ton of facts and common knowledge, and maybe even a few lies. I don't know. I'm not that well boned up on all the issues, but uh, you know, I've got to fight fire with fire, I guess. <laughs> but but yeah, like it's been a, a very interesting. Uh, cycle for that and I've always followed your, your your social media you've been very active about that but where does that come from to being that tuned in to civic issues um, I guess it's basically when you think about it politics is everywhere you go I mean you're going to have a stance or an opinion on something and it's always just really right down your, out there in your face if you think about it mm-hmm. whether it be about you know guns or health care I mean how many times do you p- drive past a hospital? How many times do you drive past a store where they sell guns? And how often do you read in the paper about somebody getting busted with some weed? I mean, these are all political issues. 
Mm-hmm. And, and you know we have the option to vote on them and stuff like that. And that's another thing too is like people want to cut out taxes, but those taxes are the reason we have schools, we have roads, we have police officers and stuff like that. And those are those are all civic issues that we need to be discussing and how we use that money. And there's a lot of people that feel like the money that goes to those government installations aren't being used properly. And I think that's where we have a lot of discourse right now. And that might that's that's definitely true, especially when you have no term limits in Congress and they could vote their own raises in. Mm-hmm. And we have lobbyists, and we have money in it, and it's 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 all a big nightmare. And we're 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 seeing the at, you know the aftershocks of all that, and the disgruntled idea of what government is, you know. And this is where we are right now. But you know, the policies have been talked to death on other other podcasts and stuff <laughs> like that. But let's let's get into the idea of like how you got into comedy now. Moving to South Carolina and start doing comedy, you know, moving from New York to go to South Carolina and then doing to- comedy here. It's a little backwards, but like that's what happened. That was your path. That's what you did. Right. But what what made you realize like, hey, I want to do comedy? Like what was the thing that was the tipping point for you? Um, I definitely like to make jokes. I mean, it, you know, it just starts off with a kid. You know, you hear a joke and then you like to tell people to get them to laugh. And uh, I thought that'd be cool if one day I could write my own jokes and get people to laugh. I've always loved that scene, and I'm sure you've seen it, in Goodfellas mm-hmm. with Joe Pesci and yes. Ray Liotta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like, what am I, a clown? Am I here to amuse you? And I always just like that part where he's just sitting there joking and keeping the crowd going, laughing. So Joe Pesci was your comedic inspiration. He's one of them, yeah. <laughs> you know, and you know, your physical comedy, you know, Home Alone, you know, <laughs> like you get that yeah. too, you know. But like, so, so like, you know, what were like, like other comedic influences for you? Well, he's. I really don't have his style, per se, um, and he's a little inappropriate, but I did like, I liked Andrew Dice Clay as a kid just because of the stuff he said, and I really wasn't supposed to say stuff like that, so it made me like it even more. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you remember these guys, the Jerky Boys? Yes, I remember the Jerky okay. Boys, yes. Oh, they were from Queens, just like I am. Yeah. And I thought it was hysterical, the prank calls they did, and I used to do prank calls a lot growing up as a kid, and yeah, it was fun. Well, you said because you're from Queens, and there's that, <laughs> that, that geographic thing like and i always i always bring this up is my my uncle was a world record holder in the shot put and he grew up in the same exact town that i did and for me as a kid seeing somebody that had grown you know into being one of the best in the world at something from my same exact geographic location and obviously has we have very similar genetic makeup because we're from the same family so i have some of those genes as well and seeing that it is possible to go on to be the best of the world or something, you know, and, and I have that as far as like being, you know, a role model for somebody and, you know, for you, you know, the Queens and the jerky boys, Hey, these guys make people laugh on a national scene. You know, and I think that's very important to you. Did you, have you ever made that connection yourself that like, Oh, because I share the same airspace as these guys that I could be just successful as them. Sure. Why not? You just got to find a way to do it. Mm-hmm. Well, what was your way to do it? What was it? Like, it was like, I, I, like, I like making people laugh, but what makes you think you were going to get on stage? Like, like what was, what, what, what's that story? Well, like I said, a- after like going through a, a breakup, I went to my first open mic up in Charlotte. It was a place called SK Net Cafe, mm-hmm. which you, you might have heard of it. It became, later on, became Crown Station, mm-hmm. which I'm, I think you had gone there before. Yeah, I've been been the crown. That, that's that was my first place. Right. Yeah. So before it was that, it was called, a place called SK Net, mm-hmm. and I don't know if they changed owners when they became a new building. But anyway, I just went up there one day, and I well, actually I contacted someone on back when MySpace was relevant, mm-hmm. and found out there was an open mic, and I went up there and I just signed up. And Ryan Van Gengen, who I'm sure you've heard of, mm-hmm. he was the open mic host back then. That's back when he was I think he was working just maybe in a restaurant and doing open mic comedy, and then. His career started taking off. Mm-hmm. Well, what what was your first time like? Uh, well, I went in there. No, I really didn't know anybody. I just signed up, and then uh, he called my name, and he said it right. I was happy to hear him say Chris Carrado because a lot of people mess up my last name. And he got it right, and like right when I got on stage, a whole bunch of people came in, and I got very nervous. But I just went up there and just tried to do the best I could. Would well, you remember some of the the jokes or topics you talked about? Probably some inappropriate stuff I shouldn't say right now. Because <laughs> at first I tried to be very shocking and a little well, raw. Obviously, your, your choice were Andrew Dice Clay. <laughs> exactly. Who wouldn't exist in, in this you know PC mm. climate as we see it today. Mm. You know, 
but that's one of those things about that 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 you know that character is that it, it, you understood what it was and you understand it's going to be like this like Anthony Jeselnik you understand what he's going to say like Tosh is going to say what he's going to say but like it was always a character but when you see somebody go up in an open mic and they don't have that context you just look like a crazy person <laughs> <laughs> like did you feel like a crazy person no 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 just having fun mm-hmm. okay cuz i felt like a crazy person <laughs> and i i, I didn't know how to make the make those turns and make those things and and for me like you know race is a big thing and you know the stupidity towards it and stuff like that but sometimes when you say it it doesn't come off quite as eloquently as it, it should and i remember i think i got the light like much sooner than i was supposed to because a bunch of uh, african-american women walked in and i think uh, jason b realized oh i better get him off stage for his own safety <laughs> <laughs> so that's my first experience i'm trying i was trying and he recognized it was my first time he recognized that i was dabbling and i didn't have the skill set to make what i was saying funny uh, it's best to get him off stage as soon as possible <laughs> And 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 I thank him for that. I don't know if that was exactly how the story went, if, or if my time was exactly up. But I just remember me getting into material and his his phone going up immediately and waving me off. Huh. I, I remember that being my first first time. But uh, I, and I always feel like your first time, like like I had a friend of mine that had done it a couple of times, uh, Zane Riley. I don't know if you remember him or not. He came around and did the open mics at Crown a couple of times, and he said something to me afterwards that made the most sense is and it was something that was going through my head was like okay it happened you know you you weren't the worst that was here tonight um because i think schneider was still coming around (laughs) at the time so like you're safe as far as that goes because you weren't the worst and you obviously weren't the best and you didn't change comedy when you went up there because you know, there's always that feeling like, what if I do this and I'm the best at ever? You know what I'm saying? Like right away. Like and it's, that's like a small thought that goes through, that goes through everybody's head. So you have to like squash both those things and then realize it just happened. And that's sometimes the the best thing that can happen to you the first time you go up. Like, you know, do you did you feel that or do you ever give any thought to it like that way? Because I always gave that a lot of thought. I'm like, oh, I just needed it to happen. So I've done it. You know what I'm saying? And that's why if there's like long periods of time between when I do it because of my travel schedule with wrestling, if I'm out of town for a week and I, and I can't get to some open mics on the road that, you know, sometimes that first one back, I'm like, I just need to do it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Just to feel like I can still do it. You know what I'm saying? Because I feel like if I do them all right in the row, I feel like I'm I'm sharp. But if there's been long periods of time, you know, like if there's been a week, I'm like, oh, I just need to do it just to feel like it just happened. You know, like like you ever give that that type of thought to it? To just like get it out of my system? Yeah, because yeah, it's kind of therapeutic. Mm-hmm. You know? Do you feel that way? Therapeutic? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. There, there's things that I, I say sometimes at, at, at open mics, and I go, "This is not going to be a long term bit for me," <laughs> but I just need to say this and make this joke about this, like just for tonight. Yeah. Because it's in my head, you know. And sometimes, like in an improv scene and stuff like that, like you know, in line games, you, you they give you a topic, and you're supposed to come up with these 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 puns or these one liners, and they just give you a topic, and you're sitting on the back line, and when you get that idea, you're supposed to come to the front and say it. But if you're sitting on the back line and you've got this idea and you don't know if it's good or it's bad, you know, if you don't just walk out and say it, whether it's good or it's bad, you know, it's going to sit in your mind and you won't get to the next thing. So the best thing is just to go out there and just say it and have it just happen. It might be the worst thing that's ever been said before in an entire life, or it might be the thing that gets the hugest laugh and then it's like it's the end of the show. But, you know, you won't know until you get out there. And if you don't get out there and say it, you can't get past and then create more, more jokes and more lines like that you know i always feel like that that's important so i don't know if that's what you, you feel about it uh like we had jokes where um you feel like uh it, you probably won't tell it again maybe it was just good to get it out that night something like that yeah yeah i think i've had i can't really think of any off the top of my head but i, I could definitely feel like there's some times where i just wanted to try it one time and see what happens because mm-hmm. you know you get to see how people are going to react and like okay they react this way to that right and then and then adjust to that so but, um, you know, you've run a lot of shows here in South Carolina, and they're rather interesting shows. <laughs> and, and this is what I want to talk to you is, like, how some of these shows come to be. And, and please, I could describe them, but I, in your own words, can you describe some of the, the gigs that you put together here in South Carolina? 
in, in the bars because it's an interesting environment, and I'd like for you to say it in your words. I have my words. I have <laughs> bits about my experience, you know, and I have stuff that I've discussed probably in like, you know, therapy sessions about PT PTSD about them. Oh, but, wow. <laughs> but but please tell me in your own words about these very interesting gigs that you have sprinkled all over South Carolina. I mean, just some, you know, I'll do comedy anywhere. Mm-hmm. So I mean, I've done comedy in places that have been very country like bars and then i've even done comedy and everything from like say to a gay bar and it's just all about you know you meet people and you find out they own a bar or they they work someplace that has live entertainment and it just starts off with simply hey can i do a comedy show here and and sometimes they say yes sometimes they say no sometimes you got to stay on them about it eventually they be like oh yeah okay come on Mm -hmm. so uh depending on the one you ask uh there's there's empire which is the original one by who does an outback 77 and it's just a little pizza place, just yeah. a little like kind of hole in the wall, like it's just very narrow. Like there's a bar and then a few seats and stuff. Right. Like that. It's actually they moved across the parking lot, so it's a little bit bigger now. But it, yeah, it's still a pretty small place. That one's pretty cool. Um, the crowd there is a late night crowd. That's like after Thursday night football. So you have people just getting off a second shift. Um, then they got one called Koozies, which you've also been to, and that's in Catawba, which is a little bit of a hike. Um, but it's in the pretty much middle of nowhere. We'll talk about Catawba as far as like a town. Like how big is it? Like if you were to estimate the size of a population. Oh, wow. I'm a few thousand maybe. I don't know. Okay. Well, I didn't even know if it's technically even a town or if it's like one of those things where it's like there's a couple houses, there's a mail mailbox, and then there's like a, a civic building and that's it. <laughs> well, they do have a post office. Okay. <laughs> Well, that's usually like one of the qualifications for a town. Yeah. You know, because I, like I said, I, I've, I come from a town of 82 people. So, like, it's pretty much a gas station, a town hall, recreation center, and like a restaurant. And then wow. post. And we just got rid of our post office, uh, uh, off, our post office. And now it's just like a, just a box <laughs> that people walk up to now. So, and get their mail. But, uh, but yeah, that's usually the qualifications. But Catawba middle of nowhere like it's and just kind of like in the bar is like dark you know like and kind of like you you'll miss it you know if you you don't you know don't see it right yeah for sure but like to tell me more about the atmosphere in that bar well when you walk in you're probably gonna smell cigarette smoke because you could still smoke cigarettes it's a private bar um so yeah i always have to make sure i throw my clothes in the wash as soon as i get home Mm -hmm. but uh you, you got a bunch of confederate flags in there which you know isn't a big deal to me, but some of the other comedians I've had come in, I always have to tell them, look, it's fine. Don't worry about it. It's cool. Uh, the people there are very nice, and they, they love the comedy. Um, they might talk to you during your set, and I always tell my comedians, I say, look, you may not want to come with a set, really, you know, because mm-hmm. you're just going to do lots of one-on-ones and talking to people, and they're not, they're not really heckling you. They more or less just want to feel part of the show. So a lot of times you're just going to get your material just from talking to the crowd. Yeah, and it's it's very much you have to like they want to make it about them a little bit, but yeah. you you kind of got to make it a little about them because that's kind of the gig. Yes, it's it's very interesting. I, when I I was there, I feel like it made me very sharp and it's astute to what's going on in the room, <laughs> in that you have to like I, I'm managing you, I'm talking to you, I'm talking to you now, I'm paying attention to you, and just working around all aspects of the room and keeping people interested in you all periods of time and stuff like that. And it's, it, I think it's a true exercise in that and trying to sync up with the crowd and the people that can pull everybody together and focus on them at the same time in one single thought. That's like the best. I haven't been able to do it yet, but hopefully, you know, the next time I go down there, I'll be able to, but I think it's a true, you know, testament to your strength as a comedian and, and, and your confidence. Yeah. Cause you can't come in weak to any of the rooms that you run. Mm-mm. You know, and but the Empire is a little bit easier. Like, I remember you put me up uh, the last time and just had me start. And it was basically people walking to sit down where last time it was nobody was paying attention. But the, the last time I thought was quite good and getting that idea of syncing everybody up to paying attention. This is a comedy show. And I felt like I got a lot better that night because you allowed me to go up there first and just have everybody talk while people walk in, <laughs> which is what like MCs like I just did it last night at my show at the Muse. You know what I'm saying? Where it's a little more of a controlled environment and people that were coming for a comedy show, but people were showing up late. People were getting drinks and they were <laughs> working their way over the seats. And But the show has to start right now. But somebody has to be up on stage to let people know that it's starting right now. So somebody has to tell those jokes. And then people, somebody, that person has to sync everybody up and let them get in a mindset that, hey, we're going to hear jokes and that's what we're going to listen to right now. And it's like... It, 
and last night, you know, me being the MC and starting the show off like that and trying to get jokes and people to pay attention that let everybody know and feel like they're included in the show was something I kind of learned from doing one of your shows, you know. So I feel like that that that's important, you know, especially on the shows. Yeah, if you can get them to listen to you, I mean, that's that's some good stuff right there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Have you seen anybody just like? Chris, I hate you. Don't ever bring me back. Again. Yeah, of course. <laughs> it's like, why did you bring me here? I, you know, I, yeah, yeah. It, to, to me, it's like li- lifting heavy when doing one of your shows. It's like, all right, this is this is me. You know, I'm gonna. This is the day I put a thousand pounds on the squat rack, and we're gonna see if I do it. <laughs> I'm, I'm working out with 850 on a regular basis with some reps, but we're gonna put something up today to see if I, I probably will fail. We'll see what happens <laughs> if I can get three reps on this, and it's. That's that's the analogy that I make with that. It's definitely lifting heavy and stuff like that. But what makes you want to do that? You know, like what makes you want to run shows and 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 put more comedy out there? Which I'm always a fan of people trying to put comedy out there as much as possible. I love the producing side of it too, and the booking, the marketing. I I just like the idea of getting people some live entertainment, that, and not not as many people have been doing it around here. And comedy's, you know, it's I think it's growing in the area, mm-hmm. but uh. I just want to help make it grow as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, also too, on top of you, you know, doing comedy and promoting your own shows, like I said, we mentioned earlier, you've, you've had a couple of, uh, of fights as, as a boxer yeah. already. And you, you've kind of got into this whole, you know, boxing thing a little bit later in life. You know, I don't want to put your age out there if you don't want to put it out there. But uh, that's fine. I'm 35. You're 35. <laughs> okay. So you're, you're just a year older than me, you know? So like you just, and when did you start boxing? Three years ago. Three years ago. So you, you got into it in your early 30s, yeah. which most people start very young. What made you want to get into it at 32 years old? Because I finally just said, you know what? Enough is enough of thinking about doing it. I met some people that were, were doing it, and I hooked up with them, and then I just didn't stop. Well, who were those people you hooked up with? Well, when I was working at the gym, mm-hmm. when I first started working there, this guy came in. And he was actually – he did the opposite of what I did. He's from Rock Hill, but he moved to New York. Mm-hmm. But he was just in town visiting. A gentleman named Shedrick is actually his name. And we started talking about the difference between New York, the South, and we somehow we got into boxing. And I said, you know, I've always kind of wanted to box. He's like, well, if you want, I could show you some stuff on the bag because he boxes. I'm like, okay, cool. So we did. And naturally, he, you know, was going to go back home. But my current boxing coach was a personal trainer at the gym. And he saw that I was doing that. And he asked me if I was interested in learning how to box. And I said, yeah. So uh, I just started going to box with him. And he he started off just having a boxing gym in his garage mm-hmm. and then i just continued on with it and decided i wanted to compete eventually okay well where are, where are the gyms <clears> in the <throat> facilitating that because one thing that when i got into pro wrestling the idea of like you know how do i get into this thing you know what i'm saying like i had no clue about pro wrestling schools like i was an impression uh at a, at a young age the way you get into wrestling is you play defensive tackle for the university of miami jim watches jim ross watches you do the bench press a couple of times you do a couple arm drags in the ring and then all of a sudden you debut at madison square garden as rocky maivia <laughs> and that's what i understand the path of that but then i had to realize later that these, there's these wrestling schools and then I found it later. Oh my gosh, there's one close to me. And then I started finding like, oh my gosh, there's so mo- so many more out there. Oh my gosh, there's so many like different places I could have gone, you know. And there's so many different options I could have had as opposed to thinking that this was the only one in the entire state or this is the only one in the region, you know. And and they were just out there and everywhere. But when you found out that you know there were places to even box down here in Rock, Rock Hill, like, you know, what was your thought process there? Like, how'd you stumble onto a place that you you could train regularly? It I actually kind of stumbled upon me. No. Yeah, because that, like I said, my current coach saw me working out with somebody and then asked me to come check out his gym. Okay. And what, what, what's his gym like? like, like as far as like compared to some of the other gyms you've seen? Well, like I said, it started off in his garage. So, of course, he had, he had like, you know, this, you know, a setup what you typically see in a garage. And he got some weights, heavy bag, speed bag, stuff like that, and just on mats. And that's just what we did our drills with, you know, everything from bag work, shadow boxing, jump rope, um, mitts, mitt work, mm-hmm. and then sparring. Mm-hmm. Well, what, well, what's one of the things that you, what was the hardest lesson you had to realize about yourself immediately when it comes I'm to... I'm out of shape. I was out of shape. Was that was that, that what it was? Oh, yeah. Getting, I got winded pretty fast because when you start moving and fighting, it's just mentally and physically, it's very draining. Because, mm-hmm. you, you, you're, you know, when you lift, you're just moving your legs and it's a very anaerobic exercise. But when you're moving your entire body in a, in a movement for continuously, it's a very aerobic exercise. And that's why, you know... 
it's, it's very important. That's why I do a lot of cardio and a lot of, you know, high reps, low, low rest time to keep that aerobic yes. about me for my in-ring stuff and stuff like that. So that's something that you had to learn right there. But like, what about boxing and, and fighting in general? Did you learn about yourself? Uh, well, I learned that, uh, okay. I learned that I was a much better fighter than I was, say, an athlete, like a ball player. Because mm-hmm. for the longest time, I, I wanted to like, I like baseball, basketball, football, and I just was never really, didn't do it very well, didn't play very well. And it was very frustrating, especially when I had all the brothers that were good at that kind of stuff. So I guess what I learned about myself was that I'm much more geared for the fighting than, uh, the you know, playing basketball, baseball. Yeah, because I was horrible at all of those as well. <laughs> I was probably the worst basketball player of all time, hmm. it, hands down. But uh, and like you know, shot putting I was good at football. I was, I played offensive line because all I had to do was just hit the guy in front of me. <laughs> that is the easiest thing. <laughs> and then if you're on defensive line, just find the ball and, and tackle that guy. You know, and sometimes he might run right into you. So like that's convenient. Yeah, it's very convenient, and you look like a genius when it happens. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, that's one of those things I found about me. But also another thing that I've learned over time. You know, like obviously. Yours is a predetermined, like my my athletic endeavor is. But one thing that I've learned over time is like fighters and especially a lot of pro wrestlers sometimes, or at least ones that are more intelligent, uh, are very secure individuals, you know, because you know your limitations, you know what you can and can't do and kind of figure out like how do I, you know, not cover up, but eliminate my weaknesses or limit them or make them smaller you know, so I can be more successful and stuff like that. And I feel like fighters are more more secure with themselves. As far as like what fighting, you talked about it made you more in aerobic shape. But what did fighting do for you mentally? Definitely, you know, build your self esteem when you practice and put the time in and see what you could do. That's when you know it definitely builds your confidence, especially as you do it more and you start to box people who haven't been doing it as long. And you could see how much better you can do against them as opposed to when you were the one getting whooped around the ring. Mm-hmm. It's good to know that you now have technique and skill to put a beating on someone else. Yeah, and the, you need those little successes sometimes. Yes. And, and that's even the same thing with comedy, too. Like, you have to have those little successes to keep yourself in it sometimes. You know, and, and you know, how, how do you strive for those every day? Like, how do you get through those times of the, that are tough where you're not get, getting those little successes? With comedy, boxing, or just anything? Both, any of those. Uh, just try to do the best you can with what you're doing, finish it out, and then look back and see what you did wrong and maybe what you should try different next time. Mm-hmm. You know, like, you know, like, are there are any types of, like, tools that you use that you're like, hey, I need to really just, I just need to just keep going up in comedy and it's going to work out, or in boxing, like, I just, just need to keep doing it. Yes, you just need to keep doing it. You know, it's just the plowing forward mentality yes. and stuff like that. That's kind of where you plan. But um, as far as like, where, where do you want to take these things? You know, this comedy and promoting shows and, you know, a boxing and fighting and judo and all this. Where, where do you want to take this? Is this like, you know, like where, where are you going with all of this? It's really, uh, you know, tough to say. I mean, at 35 years old, becoming a, any type of pro fighter, I pretty much would have to just just focus on that and nothing else at this point because that's i'm no spring chicken i mean i'm not old but i'm not i'm not my 20s are, as i like to say is dead as disco mm-hmm. but i definitely want to keep training and fighting amateur and then just just look at it like that not necessarily for money or anything like that or become pro just keep doing amateur and see what happens as far as the comedy goes i am actually going to start working on a comedy book because mm-hmm. um, I, I don't know if you know this i did self-publish two books Tell me more about this. Okay. Well, um, my first book, it, but both of these books are, um, are fictional books based off of nonfiction. So, for instance, in my first book, which is called A New York Night with Carmine McNally, it's about this guy, you know, and every time he starts to move forward in life, something bad happens and he has to start over. That's the main theme of the book, just trying something over and not giving up. And some of the things he did in his life, I didn't do. Mm-hmm. So I interviewed people who did. So I can mold him, the other characters, and the situations that are in the book. So I interviewed everything from like Marines to local bands to high school football players and coaches. And then, like I said, I, when I finally felt like I was done, I went to 
you know, get it published, well, edited and then published. And then I said, I, then I started working on my second book a couple of years later. And I was about five totally different people. It's called Tubman's Five Stories of Tragedy. It's about a town called Tubman, named after Harriet Tubman, and five totally different people who don't know each other, but they meet each other on a bus in the end. And with that one, I even did everything from um, the gay community, black community, uh, Korean War veteran, World War II veteran, um, alcoholics, um, strippers, mm-hmm. <laughs> or as they like to prefer to be called, entertainers. And then, you know, I had them self-published. Uh, I'm not going to lie to you, I've spent more money than I've made, but it's something out there, you know. I've sent them off to celebrities. I've sent them off to local bookstores and just maybe one day something great's going to happen. Well, what was your what made you want to write like like books like that? What what was the driving force in that? Because like as, as most comedians know and anybody that tries to write anything it's like ugh. it's it's almost like <laughs> Pee-wee Herman in like uh Pee-wee's Big Adventure where he's like he sees the snakes and he runs like in the pet store when it's on fire. Like he sees the snakes and he's like, ah, and then runs and saves a bunch of puppies. <laughs> and then like runs back in, sees the snakes again, ah, and then saves a bunch of fish. And then finally he gets like the snakes out of the burning building and he hates it. I feel like that's a good analogy for writing sometimes, <laughs> at least for me. But what made you want to sit down and write a book? Um, basics, books? basically Whoa. what happened was, I'm not going to lie to you, I daydream a lot. I zone out a lot. So what happened is I'd see certain things. And I thought to myself, that sounds pretty cool. Like, for instance, my first book, the opening scene is uh, he's in his studio apartment in Manhattan. And, you know, and he wants to tell a story. He's like, you want to hear a story? I, you know, I got one for you. And I just saw this guy in an apartment in the dark. And then I was like, okay, write that down. And then after that, I just started more, more and more ideas. So I started coming, what if I do this? So what if I make him do that? Or what about these people I could add in? What should they do? And then I just just started doing it. I mean, I didn't. And then I'd go back, I'd jump back and forth. Sometimes I write about this, sometimes I write about that. Naturally, I didn't write the book from first page to last page, you know. Mm-hmm. But just, was, was sitting down and writing easy for you? Was it, was it? Were you able to go, like, did you see it like, all right, between three and five, I will go write, and this is what I will do? Or was it a situation I, I've been hit with inspiration and I have to go write right now? See you in about eight hours. <laughs> Both. Okay. Yeah, that's how it was. Uh, and then... A lot of times I'd sit there and ideas would flow. Sometimes they wouldn't. And I'd be like, well, let me just write a few lines and then just to do something and then stop. But a lot of that was interviewing. And that was one of some of my favorite parts was doing what I call the groundwork and meeting up with somebody and sitting down and talking about their life and their experience. Therefore, I could, you know, properly write the story. Mm-hmm. So it was authentic. Yeah. So you, so that person has living aspects that are out in the world. It's not something that you've made up. Right. You know what I'm saying? This is this is something that is happening in somebody's living, breathing life, and you know, a breathing life into a character and stuff like that. You know, or looking back on the books, or you know, anytime I've worked on a, a docu- documentary, I think that's the only way that would be even close to you writing a book. <laughs> I look back, I'm like, ah, oh, I should have done this. Oh, this would have been better. Are there anything with the books that you get frustrated about, or do you feel like that from beginning to end? I did exactly what I wanted, and I put out the exact voice and character and story that I wanted. Yeah, for the most part, um, I feel pretty happy with them. I my second book's only a hundred pages, so maybe you know going back, maybe I could have made it more. Let's say character depth, but sometimes I notice people people like to read, but they need to constantly keep being entertained. So if you write about something for like two, three hundred pages, you might lose a lot of people, mm-hmm. unless someone just really has a passion for that type of thing or genre. So that's why like, I tried to combine so many things that really have nothing to do with each other to keep people interested and put something out there for everybody. Yeah, and some of the characters you described, you know, there was very much like, oh, I would have, should have type people, you know what I'm saying? Or or like, seemed like almost kind of tragic figures, at least the way that you described to me and stuff like that. What makes you want to write characters like that? Uh, don't get me wrong, I'm a, I'm a sucker for happy endings and love stories, but sometimes you just got to see the cold, hard truth of life sometimes. And you just want to put that out there yeah. in a book and just and display it in its ugliness. Absolutely. I like to give people hope and then just take it away. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but uh, what else are you doing with your life that I don't know about? I, I, I'm very surprised that I didn't know that you wrote books. Like that's Yeah, uh, I guess that's really all right now. I mean, as far as the comedy and the fighting and the, the writing and stuff like that, that's about it right now. Mm-hmm. But I mean, like, those are a lot of things, Christopher. Like... 
you know, you could just focus on one of these things and, and you could live a happy and normal life and stuff like that. But makes what makes you want to dip your toe in, in this pond and this pond and this pond? Like, you know, because I figure something's got to give eventually. I'm going to be somewhere and it's I feel like it's just something big's going to happen eventually. Maybe it's just a pipe dream, but I figure it's worth a shot. Mm-hmm. Get your get your face out there. Yeah. Anyway, possible. But Even if it's getting punched. Say. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> But anyways, we, we're getting a little bit close to the end. I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I definitely want to leave enough room for this part yeah. so that we have plenty of room to explore in in this part because it's kind of the point of the whole podcast. It's the idea of, and we're kind of circling the drain as it is right now with, with this topic, and I've been holding it off for this point, is the idea of success. It's basically, I, I sit down and talk to uh, comedians, pro wrestlers, um, writers, brewers, restaurateurs, politicians, all types of different people, all different walks of life, you know, and I basically ask them about the topic of success. You know, what does it mean to you? Is it clearly defined for you? Do you seek it out every single day? Do you have a clear plan? Do you know what it is for you? Is it properly defined? Does a dollar amount attached to it? Um, basically, when I say the word success, what pops in your head? Um. Being happy with what you're doing. Just just being happy? Like, I mean, you could be happy with just doing, you know, just comedy, but, you know, writing a book or, or just writing a book. But why all of these, these these things? Like, what is it about, you know, your life that, that, that would make you happy? Is it doing a lot of things? Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Uh, you know, like I said, being happy with what you're doing. And uh, like I said, uh, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I mean, who doesn't want money? It would be nice to... Be able to have a you know a good bit of money to put down in a home and have security and all that type of stuff, which, which I'm sure most people. Kind but of what, do. what is it about all, all of these things that make you happy? Is it the accomplishment? Is it the, the the actual like journey of it? Like, do you get immediately sad when you finish like a, a large project or a fight? Because like I finished a documentary and I actually got extremely depressed because it had become my life for like six to eight months, and then it was done. And then I didn't know what to do with my life. Oh, know? wow. No, no, I never felt down about anything. Um, I, if anything, it motivates me to want to keep moving forward. Mm-hmm. But, you know, but is, but is it the, is it the accomplishment, do you think? Or is it the, the task of it that you like? I like, like I said, the journey. Mm-hmm. And I like the people that I meet while I'm doing it. So, like, if you're, if you're writing a book and you're sitting down and doing an interview and laying that ground with that you're talking about, like, that's an enjoyable day for you. Oh, yeah. You know. Oh, what what is it about it? Is it the fact that you're connecting with somebody? Is it the fact that you are working towards a task? Like, what is it about? It? It's it's the connection when I could say, okay, this is what I want this character to do, and now I'm going to meet somebody who did this, and I'm able to perfectly put together everything from the thoughts, the words, and the actions that take place in the book based upon what I was educated on from that person who actually did it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and also like you know, w- with comedy and stuff like that, as far as it relates to goes, like like you could just be doing it and stuff like that. But what is it about it, like that you enjoy, that you want to like chase down to be successful about it? I like I like the idea of you know maybe being a promoter one day. Mm-hmm. Maybe I could be a promoter of both fights and comedy. You know, and make a profession out of doing stuff like that. I love public relations. Mm-hmm. Well, what what about is it with public relations? Is, is the connecting with people? Yes, absolutely. Well, to know well, as many people as possible. What's your what, what's your joy like? What's your idea? Are you a person that likes to be out in front of the crowd, or is it you like the fact? Is it the fact that like this person wanted something for me, and I brought and I delivered them this product? Well, both, because that's why I like hosting so much because I could be I could do the behind the scenes work, mm-hmm. but yet still get on stage and do some time. Mm-hmm. So, so you still need to have that little bit of attention. To oh it. yeah, of course. Yeah. I don't I don't have to be the I don't necessarily have to be the headline or anything like that. Just but it's good to be a part of it. It's good to say, hey, I I help, I worked on this, and I'm doing something with it too. Mm-hmm. Well, very cool. Well, is there is there anything you want to let people know about before we we get out of here and stuff like that? Like you know, especially like social media, or how they can look up for your shows, um, any piece of information that I, I we've glossed over, or you like to expand upon? Yeah, if, if you ever in like I said, the Rock Hill area, you know, look me up on Facebook. It's Christopher Carrado. Um, always I always like to do is support local comedy. Or I do hash, you know, hashtag, hashtag the Corrado brand, or hashtag koozies, hashtag empire. You know, if you get time and want to buy my books on Amazon, like I said, a New York night with Carmine McNally. Uh, you know, and then you got Tubman's Five Stories of Tragedy. 
I both I feel you know that they're not they don't cost a lot of money. They're both pretty good books, and you know I'm always open to see what people like. Okay. Well, Chris, thank you very much for taking time out of your day. This is a wonderful conversation. Yeah, man, I had a good time. Thank you. Thank you.